They say football is a results business, and after two poor results, Fernando Genesis' Brazilian revolution looks to be stuttering. But anyone who thought this transition would be seamless had probably had too much caipirinha. Because when the CBF appointed Fernando Genesis as caretaker manager, it wasn't just about hiring a man to get results. No, this was a clear shift in a direction away from a footballing philosophy that was essentially imported from Europe and towards one developed in Brazil that, in theory, better suits Brazilian players and fans alike. Big emphasis on in theory. If you have no idea what I'm talking about, I suggest you watch my previous two videos on Genesis Fluminense and Brazil, but today we're diving into the first major downturn in the Genesis era, looking into why Brazil failed against Venezuela and Uruguay, but more interestingly, where they go from here. So if you're enjoying my coverage of Brazil and want me to continue this series, do make sure to leave a like and let's get into it. What I love about doing these Fernando Genese videos is we get to analyse football through a very unique lens, because often what Genese asks his players to do is the exact opposite of what most coaches in Europe would want. And in his first two games, against Bolivia and Peru, that was really the big issue, that players from European teams were struggling to adapt to Genese's football. And it was kind of the same story in these latest games, just in a slightly different way. The common theme against Venezuela and Uruguay was that Brazil struggled to break down their opponent's defensive block. Now, Uruguay and Bielsa were of course more aggressive in terms of their pressing, but Brazil actually played out from that press pretty consistently, and that was one of the biggest positives of this round. They often created an overload in midfield and found avenues through. It was when Uruguay then dropped back into this mid-block that was the problem. It was sort of this 4-2-3-1, and against Venezuela it was this 4-4-1-1. Brazil generally struggled to create chances from these situations. In fact, they haven't scored now from open play in three whole games, and compared to their average chance creation from the previous World Cup qualifiers, these last two games were very underwhelming. Average shots are down, fewer shots inside the box, fewer big chances, and of course, fewer goals. By the way, if you're wondering where this data is from, it's all from SofaScore, so you can get access to it yourself by downloading the SofaScore app through the link in the description. Also, since most of these Brazil videos get demonetized by the evil CBF, you'd really be supporting the channel by clicking the link, every download helps. But anyway, let's start at the back with Brazil, because it still feels to me that Marquinhos and Gabriel Magalhães are confused as to what Janice is asking for. They both feel, I'm going to say, sluggish, almost indecisive in possession, as if they're sort of second-guessing themselves with what they should do with the ball. On top of that, Gabriel seems to insist on carrying the ball to the feet of his teammates rather than letting the ball do the work, and that's really frustrating when Brazil have the opportunity to progress and he just closes down the angles himself. That said, it really was a mixed bag with the centre-backs because sometimes Gabriel was much more decisive finding the spare man, and I know this seems like a minor detail, but it really does affect the rhythm of Brazil's game. If the centre-backs aren't moving the ball quickly and into the right areas, then the attack is basically dead before it begins, so this is something that does still need improvement. Unsurprisingly though, Brazil's build-up was best when it was Neymar making himself available, who was again the conductor of most good things that Brazil were doing. You can see here he's getting on the ball a lot, and he's dropping quite deep to help out the centre-backs, uh, but he's also very good at finding those spaces between the lines that allows the centre-backs to be more decisive with their passing, and from there he's just really clever with how he combines with those around him. So the real problems occur when Neymar doesn't take that responsibility, so if he takes off the wide position, or is close to the centre-forward, that's when this midfield is a little bit more dysfunctional. So last time I talked about Bruno Guimaraes and the problems that he was having in this setup, his tendency to switch the ball into space too quickly, and unfortunately I sort of have to focus on him again. Uh, I just don't think he's performing the sort of associative role that this team really needs. We know the plan under Janice is to play close together and mainly on one side of the pitch, Therefore, his teams often need a midfielder to go beyond the ball to create the next progressive option and opportunities for tabellas. But far too often, Gimaraes wants to sit in line with or behind the ball, to the point that Casemiro had to actually tell him to push forward, or even take up those positions for himself. In fact, you can see from their heat maps against Uruguay that that was the case. Casemiro was the one going beyond the ball and basically playing as an eight, which isn't where you want your least technical midfielder to be. In a similar vein, Gimaraes also has the tendency to pass and stand still, or even pass and move backwards, rather than pass and move forwards, or Takui my boy. And if you've watched that Fluminense video, you'll know that this principle is integral to this style of football, because without it you'll never be able to attack the space in front of you. 
Remember, your players aren't patiently waiting in space like in positional play, so those guys behind the ball eventually have to arrive ahead of it, and that's where pass and move forward, Takui Mavoy, comes in. And that's actually a criticism that I could make of a lot of Brazilian players, unfortunately. There just wasn't enough forward movement across these games. You sort of ended up with a lot of players around the ball, which yes, is what Janice wants, but without then adding forward movement, you just can't disrupt the opposition. However, what doesn't help in that regard is that Brazil in general were really impatient with the way that they attacked, because often when they did find those overloads, players in pockets, or, or even out wide, there was an immediate impetus to just drive forward and attack the back line. Again, that is how things tend to work in positional play, because when you unlock space, there are wingers or eights there waiting to exploit it, but in this system, those players aren't necessarily there, so if you immediately drive forward, you just end up hopelessly outnumbered. Gabriel Jesus in particular was guilty of this, but so too was Vinicius, who had a really poor couple of games, frequently driving forward and trying to take people on in situations that just needed, as they say, a bit more pausa, leading to a lot of unsuccessful dribbles and frankly very little impact. And there is a consequence to all this, from the indecisive centre-backs to the conservative midfield to the impatience in the final third, and that is that your centre-forward simply doesn't get involved in the game. When all of this was at its worst, which was in the second half against Uruguay after Neymar's injury, you can see from Richarlison's heat map that he is completely isolated. So it's really no surprise from here that Brazil just aren't creating chances. Some of you may be thinking at this point, is this actually all worth it? Is this radical shift in philosophy actually getting the most out of these Brazilian players? Because ultimately that's the reason behind it. You know, you're getting players closer together, you're emphasizing relationships through tabellas and so on, so that your players have more freedom to problem solve and can fully express their quality. But if they aren't able to problem solve, or the principles themselves don't come naturally, then what are you actually achieving by playing this way? Just before we fully consider that, it is worth saying that both of these games could have actually gone very differently. Against Venezuela, Brazil could easily have made it 2-0 or even 3-0, and against Uruguay, although they didn't create very much, defensively they were pretty solid. I know many of you last video were asking for a full breakdown of Genesis' defensive tactics, and unfortunately I don't have time in this video for that, but what I will say is the defensive performance has not been as bad as the stats might suggest. Obviously, if you look at the goals per game and compare it to last qualifying, it doesn't look great, but those underlying numbers, the actual chances they're conceding, aren't significantly worse. Venezuela, for example, scored an absolute worldie from pretty much their only chance of the game, and against Uruguay, I actually liked Brazil's press quite a lot. They mainly forced Uruguay into long balls and tended to win the duels against Darwin Nunez. Both goals they conceded came from throw-ins, and the second one especially was really scrappy, so those results could have been different, and had they been, we'd probably be focusing more on some of the positives. Because the truth is, there have been some glimpses of that Brazilian magic that this football is supposed to encourage. Not just combinations between players, but moments of dribbling and expression. I'd say definitely Neymar and also Rodrigo to an extent have been the standout players, which is just another reason that Neymar's ACL injury is so devastating. But in any case, I think the next step is about fixing those other aspects of the team that we talked about so that we see more of this sort of expression from the forwards. And I think that could mean a bit more experimentation from Janice with his lineups. This is where it gets a bit tricky for me as someone who doesn't have an intimate knowledge of Brazilian domestic leagues. So I'd love for you guys, especially Brazilians, to get involved in the comments. Uh, but I'm going to throw a few names out there and you can tell me what you think. So at centre forward, I know there's calls for Chiquinho Suarez from Botafogo to get a call up. Uh, from what I've seen, a very physically imposing forward who is having a pretty great season. He's a top scorer with 15 goals in the Brazilian league, and that's largely because he's overperforming his XG by five, so it's questionable how sustainable that is. Uh, regardless, I think it's fair to say that Richarlison, even with limited touches, isn't showing an ability to combine with others effectively, so it's probably worth bringing somebody else in to compete with Gabriel Jesus. Onto the defenders, and it wouldn't surprise me here if Ginny's actually keeps faith with the players that he's using. Although yes, they are disrupting Brazil's build-up somewhat, these are guys who have competed at the highest level, and above all, are good defenders. Yes, they need to be more decisive and move the ball quicker, but you would hope that's something that they could work on. 
If Janice wants to switch things up, the obvious choice is Nino from Fluminense, although that would almost certainly be at right centre back. I think it will be pretty difficult to drop Gabriel purely for the fact that he's left footed, and that's really useful considering much of Brazil's build up happens on the left, just allows him to turn out of pressure and play forwards more easily. In terms of midfield, as you probably guessed, I do think this is where the most experimentation needs to happen. The two obvious names for me are Andre from Fluminense and Lucas Paqueta from West Ham. Now, I can't believe I'm saying this, but I actually think Casemiro gets a bad rep. Yes, he's pretty clunky and he makes mistakes in possession, but I think his intention is usually good. Like I've said before, he's often the one berating Bruno Gimarais after he takes up the correct position to associate, only for Gimarais to then cycle the ball away, and he's capable of some pretty creative progression. That said, Andre for me is just a lot more mobile, more available, and even in times of defending, his ability to recover puts him ahead of Casemiro in my book. Onto the other midfield slot, and it should be no surprise that I think Gimarais needs rotating out. Especially with the absence of Neymar, I just think Brazil needs a midfielder who's more progressive when it comes to those close combinations. For me, although Pacata plays in Europe, this is a role that would suit him a little bit better. He's more of a box-to-box -box eight whose tendency is to pass and move into more advanced positions. I do think of all of these suggestions, changing the number eight would probably have the single biggest impact on this team. So if there are other Brazilian-based players who you think can do this role, then do let me know because I'd be really curious to hear. And really that goes for every position we're talking about. Um, but with that, we really come to the end of my analysis of the second round of qualifying games. Obviously, a disappointing set of results if you're a Brazil fan, but we're still very early on in qualifying, and really, it's a good thing that there's this opportunity to experiment and to see what works. I know Brazilian football has a tendency to be, dare I say, short-sighted when it comes to managers. There's a history of quite ridiculous managerial turnover, but I think in this case, considering the scale of change is, in football terms, almost unprecedented, there's a good case to be more patient. If you do want me to continue this coverage of Brazil on YouTube, the best way to support this channel is to leave a like and of course to download the SofaScore app using the link in the description. That really does make a huge difference so I'd appreciate it if you did that. Other than that, thanks for watching, thanks for all your support and your feedback. As a foreigner commenting on Brazil, it can be a little bit daunting, but I appreciate everyone that's been positive or constructive with these videos. So I hope you enjoyed and I'll see you next time. Take care.